What if I told you that fewer people started taking osteoporosis medications? And for a while, this led to the fracture rates actually going down. But now we're starting to see fracture rates creep back up. And that raises big questions about how we treat osteoporosis and bone loss. In today's video, we'll explore why people are more cautious about taking medication, how treatment plans are evolving, and how you can make informed decisions to help to protect your bones. Hello, my friends. I'm Sarah, and I'm a nutritional health coach through the Institute for Integrative Nutrition, a BoneFit certified fitness instructor, and I'm also a 500 hour trained yoga teacher with additional training that's specific for osteoporosis and yoga. I'm on a mission to reduce the number of fractures that happen every year, and I am so pleased to have you join me in the journey to better bone health. To help us understand what's going on, let's take a closer look at a recent study that was published in the journal Osteoporosis International. Researchers examined osteoporosis medication use over time in both the United States and in Canada. And what they found tells a fascinating and somewhat concerning story. After 2008, the number of people starting medications like bisphosphonates dropped significantly this decline was likely driven by growing fears around side effects resulting from media coverage and also changing screening practices. But here's the interesting twist. Even though fewer people were taking medication, the fracture rates actually declined for a while. That left many people wondering, do we really need these drugs? So fast forward to today, and we're seeing those fracture rates start to rise again. So now the big question is, were we just kicking the can down the road? And what can we actually learn from this turning point in bone health care? It seems a bit counterintuitive, right? You'd think that if fewer people were being treated, that more fractures would follow. But that's not what we saw, at least not right away. So what might explain the surprising trend? There are a few possible reasons. Around the same time as this study, there was also a push in public health messaging about the importance of balance training, strength exercises, and getting enough vitamin D and calcium in your diet. More people, especially women, were starting to become proactive about their bone health through movement and nutrition, which likely helped to reduce fall-related fractures. All about that. We may have had a relatively healthier aging population also during that window of time. With people reaching their 70s and 80s in better overall shape, thanks to healthier lifestyles and improvements in healthcare that had been improving and developing through the last several decades. Many people had already been on medications for several years before 2008. And then these drugs, once they stop taking them, the drugs can still have a bit of a lingering effect on bones even after someone stops taking them, especially in people with low to moderate fracture risk. So we may also have been seeing the tail end of that benefit. The other potential reason for having fewer osteoporotic fractures reported is one that's important to be aware of, but it's concerning, really concerning. And it's that bone density screening rates also declined after 2008 which means that fewer people were actually being diagnosed with osteoporosis. This in turn may have led to fewer reported osteoporotic fractures in the data, even if bone strength was still a concern. In other words, the recorded cause of fractures may have changed even if the actual number of people with osteoporosis hadn't changed. Without having a proper diagnosis, that also implies that people didn't realize that they needed to work on improving their bone health or to know that they could improve their bone health. That possibility concerns me and bothers me. So yes, fracture rates dipped, but that may have been more of a temporary plateau than a sign that we were actually in the clear. After the temporary decline, we're now starting to see fracture rates start to tick back up and it's happening in both the United States and in Canada. 
So the important question becomes, what changed? Since around 2008, fewer people have been getting bone density scans. This is especially true for younger postmenopausal women. One large study that considered over 1.6 million women found that osteoporosis screening rates had actually declined by more than 30% among women aged 50 to 64 between 2008 and 2014. That's a big concern because if we aren't screening, we aren't diagnosing. And if we aren't diagnosing, we aren't treating early enough to actually prevent fractures from happening. So part of the rise in fracture rates that we're seeing now may be the result of people simply falling through the cracks of the healthcare system. Here in the United States where I live, Medicare does not cover having a DEXA scan until age 65. That leaves a critical window where many women in their 50s and their early 60s aren't getting screened unless they push for it by proactively asking their doctors to order the test. If you have certain risk factors, it's often possible to get a scan covered earlier. For example, if you have a family history of having osteoporosis or a medical condition that can contribute to bone loss, something like celiac disease, rheumatoid arthritis, other autoimmune conditions, digestive disorders, or having a history of cancer, then it's important and your doctor may be able to order a DEXA scan that insurance will actually cover. I also wanna bring up another health-related issue that's facing women here. And that's if you go through an early menopause or if you have a hysterectomy, it's important to ask your doctor to screen you earlier for bone loss. Menopause leads to having a large drop off in estrogen for women and that estrogen helps to prevent significant bone loss. If this happens to happen to you younger, then the bone loss could become an issue much sooner than you might think and also much earlier than it's on your doctor's radar to think about checking. I have personal experience with this. I have five children and four of them were delivered by C-section. This left a lot of scar tissue around my reproductive organs. I actually had quite a bit of scar tissue inside of my uterus. And this ultimately led to me having to have an early hysterectomy at the age of 38. The doctor left one of my ovaries to make sure that I had hormones and that was the end of the discussion. No doctor ever thought to check on my hormone levels to make sure that the ovary that I still had was actually working and doing its job to produce said hormones. In my case, the ovary that I still had didn't produce the hormones appropriately. And when I finally pushed and asked doctors to check my hormone levels, I discovered that I had less estrogen than many women who have several decades on me in age. I've started hormone replacement therapy to compensate for the deficit in my own body. But this lesson was learned the hard way and it's left me wanting to shout from the rooftops to get your hormone levels and your bone density checked, especially if you've had a hysterectomy because even if you still have ovaries, they may or may not be doing their job properly. And this brings us right back into the bigger picture that we've been exploring. Many women, whether because of a gap in screening, because they go through an early menopause, or because they have uncertainty about medication, are falling through the cracks when it comes to osteoporosis prevention and treatment. The positive side of this is that our understanding of bone health continues to evolve, and as it does, so are the treatment approaches that are available. Let's take a look at how attitudes around osteoporosis care are starting to shift and how you can take a more personalized, proactive approach to protecting your bones. For years, the message from medicine was simple. Take this medication probably for the rest of your life. Understandably, this left many people feeling uneasy, especially after the reports of rare but serious side effects started making headlines. So if you want a personalized approach and your doctor isn't currently offering that, it's okay to seek a second opinion when possible. And if switching doctors isn't an option, which I know is the reality for many people, then advocating for yourself within your current healthcare relationship can still make a big difference. 
One way to do this is to bring well-researched information like high quality medical studies to your doctor, not as a challenge to their expertise, but as an invitation for their insight. Doctors have an enormous body of knowledge and training, but it's impossible for anyone to stay up to date on every new piece of research in every field. My heart goes out to doctors. They have learned so much and they work so incredibly hard. Yet the reality is that many doctors are working within tight time constraints with healthcare systems and insurance guidelines that don't always support the kind of individualized care that we would all want. And in today's online world, many clinicians are also facing a flood of misinformation and viral health trends that understandably make them cautious. That's why I encourage you to approach these conversations with both confidence and with respect. Acknowledge your doctor's training and their hard work, and then invite them to take a look at the study or the information that you're bringing forward. In this way, you can create a true partnership, one where your doctor's expertise and your proactive involvement work together to shape the best possible care plan for you. So with that in mind, here's a list of the ways that you can seek a more personalized approach for your osteoporosis treatment plan. Some of these are things that your doctor can help with, and some are things that you can take and do on your own. So first, get a more personalized risk assessment. Doctors can use bone markers to test and to track progress, as well as considering your FRAC scores in addition to having a bone density number. All of these can help to guide treatment decisions. And also, if you have access to it, consider getting a REMS test that measures your bone density, your FRAC score, and your bone quality all at the same time. Second, consider targeted medication. Many healthcare providers are now aiming for short-term to medium-term use of osteoporosis medications with clearly defined treatment goals and plans for when and how to reassess or to pause treatment. And if you aren't keen on medication use at all, you can still get your doctor to write you a prescription for the new FDA approved medical device that's called OsteoBoost that delivers just right vibration directly to your low back and spine. You could think of this one like vibration in a fanny pack. OsteoBoost can be used with or without medication, but either way, it requires a prescription. Currently, OsteoBoost is only available in the United States, but I hope that that will change in the near future. So keep an eye out on what's happening with it. Third, increase your awareness of lifestyle factors. There's a growing emphasis on lifestyle interventions like strength training, balance work, proper nutrition, stress management, and hormone optimization. So where it's appropriate, these can be a wonderful complement, or they can potentially delay the need for medication and in some case avoid it entirely. Fourth, become an empowered patient. Ask more questions, seek out second opinions, and advocate for a treatment plan that fits your unique needs, your preferences, and your risk profile. Osteoporosis treatment is not a one-size-fits-all. What matters most is finding the right combination of strategies, whether that includes medication, lifestyle changes, hormone support, or maybe a mix of all three or just a few. Find what will help you to maintain strong and healthy bones for life. I sincerely hope that we are at a turning point in how we approach osteoporosis care. Let's get the fracture numbers to decline again, and this time, let's do it in a more sustainable way. Let's use the tools that we have that are available to us, and let's make the most of what we can do with lifestyle and modern medicine to offer us the proper diagnosis and to create the best individualized treatment plans for osteoporosis care in a way that aligns with our personal goals for better bone health. You don't have to do this alone either. If you found this video helpful, please share it with someone that you know and love 
who could also benefit from this video. And if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe so that you don't miss out on future videos about building stronger bones and having better overall health. And if you're ready to dive deeper, then check out this next video. It's packed with practical tips that you can start using today. And on that note, I look forward to talking with you soon.